Listen, just one more thing. Uh... Hello there. Welcome to my review of episode 3 of season 7 of Columbo, Make Me a Perfect Murder. First broadcast on the 25th of February 1978 on NBC. It was written by Robert Blees. Blees was born on the 9th of June 1918 in Missouri. He was a writer of numerous film and television shows from 1942 to 1985. His credits include episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Peter Gunn and Cannon, and the films Frogs, Dr. Fibes Rises Again and From the Earth to the Moon, in addition to this episode of Columbo. He died on the 31st of January 2015. He was 96. It was directed by returning director James Frawley, who also appears in a small role in this episode as Rourke. The episode begins in a very unusual way, focusing on the beat-up Peugeot of none other than Lieutenant Columbo himself. To my memory, we've only seen the Lieutenant this early on once before, and that was in a non-speaking capacity in Candidate for Crime. Here he's singing to himself in his car, In a cavern, in a canyon, excavating for a mine, there's a miner of 49er and his daughter Clementine. When a call comes in over the radio and some SWAT cars respond, Columbo manages to get himself involved in a crash with two of the cars. I think I hurt my neck. And then we cut to a TV network executive and filmmakers reviewing some film footage. It's a really odd move to start the episode like this, almost as if it's some kind of relaunch of the show, but I suspect the reason for this choice is given away in the dialogue of the following scene. As the woman leading the meeting, Kay Freestone, played by Trish Vanderveer, an actress with only a few credits to her name despite her brilliant performance in this episode, she would often appear alongside her husband, George C. Scott. As she gives the filmmaker's notes, she says, Well, we over at the network, all we get to do is pay for these pictures and try to let you know what we want and how we want it. It's my theory that a regular studio note for Columbo was to have him introduced much earlier in the episode. And so here they do that, completely out of context, in order to give the network what they want and how they want it, then cheekily reference that within the show. That's just my theory, mind you. Kay then goes back to her network offices and joins another meeting, this time of network executives, including her boss, and as we soon find out, her lover, Mark McAndrews, played by Lawrence Luckinbill best known to me as Spock's half-brother Cybok in Star Trek V The Final Frontier. After that meeting, Mark receives a quick phone call from returning actor Patrick O'Neill as Frank Flanagan, who offers Mark a promotion in New York. We then cut to Mark's beach house, where Kay is with him, and he tells her about the job offer in New York. He then tells her he wants her to stay in L.A., she assumes it's to take over his job there. But no, he tells her she's not cut out for it and throws an incredibly patronising babe into the conversation while he's at it. Luckin' Bill is excellent as the condescending, arrogant and downright nasty McAndrews here, essentially using this new job to dump Kay while trying to keep his options open with her. Your sympathies at this point are definitely with her. He manages to make it worse as he dismisses her involvement in his own success and how close they really were as he taunts her. Then he tells her he's bought her a new car. You were supposed to find these out there. 450 SL. 
We then quickly cut to Colombo getting some chiropractic therapy for a minor injury he sustained in the earlier crash. And we then cut back to Kay, clearly distraught, listening to a countdown she has recorded. It's a welcome change to the format to see the decline of a murderer before the murder happens, as we get to watch and understand why Kay feels driven to commit murder. It's always interesting to see how the writers vary the Columbo formula and to see if the changes work or don't, and I really enjoy what they do here in the first act of this episode. The next morning, Kay returns to work with new steely determination, being much colder and demanding to her underlings. Sorry, Jonathan. I'm going to need all those Clay Gardner demographs first thing in the morning. Kay, that's going to take all night. Well, unless you'd like to explain your troubles to Mr. Flanagan, you'd better plan on spending the night. While being obsequious to Frank Flanagan, who is now in L.A. to view the film she's been working on. She then goes to the projection booth where she speaks to the projectionist, played by a returning James McEachin, who was last seen way back in Etude in Black. He assures her the showing will run perfectly, including each of the real changes, for those of you unaware, or if you missed the crash course provided in the episode Double Exposure, all movies used to come on 10-15 to 15 minute reels of film, which the projectionist would have to change. In this case, they use relatively advanced projectors with digital counters to help the changeover. Later projectors would be fed with one big reel laid horizontally instead of vertically to avoid having to swap the film over. And now of course it's almost entirely digital. But this real change is integral to Kay's plan and alibi. While the projectionist isn't looking, she reduces the timer on the projector and then asks him about some other films Flanagan may want to see. He goes to get them and as soon as he's gone, she uses the extra time she's created to execute her plan and her former lover. She uses the countdown she recorded to keep herself to time and head straight to Mark's office where she shoots him. His assistant hears the gunshot and goes to investigate as she sneaks off and hides the gun in the roof of an elevator. There's a moment of tension as she's almost caught by a security guard who stops to admire a copy of Playpen which is in reception. Please do let me know in the comments if it was normal to have softcore porn in reception of major corporations, because I'm not so sure, and it definitely wouldn't fly today. She makes it back to the projection room just in time to make the real change, and before the projectionist returns. A risky strategy all around, considering how many things could go wrong from being spotted to the real breaking to the projectionist coming back earlier than she expected. But then the episode wouldn't require Columbo to investigate if something had gone wrong. Flanagan calls her into the screening room and we see silently from the booth as he breaks the news to her of Mark's death and she reacts suitably upset. It would appear that she goes home and when she returns the next morning Columbo is there in a neck brace. Honestly, I had completely forgotten about that little touch in this episode. It's something that has become a little bit of a cliché, giving your lead character a one-off minor injury, and it's played largely for laughs here, but doesn't get in the way of the episode. Columbo seems to adopt a very light-hearted way with Kay as soon as they meet cracking jokes and making light of the whole situation. Is there any way I can be of help, Lieutenant? I don't believe so, ma'am. Nice of you to offer. We think it's a whiplash. The doctors are making tests. He explains that they haven't yet found the murder weapon, and Kay shows Columbo a series of cranked letters Mark received as Flanagan asks her to take over Mark's duties. She appears to have gotten everything she wants, and all it took was one little murder. Columbo is unconvinced by the letters, as he explains Mark must have known the killer, as he never got up off the couch. 
a natural reaction if he knew the killer, but a very odd one if a stranger had just walked into his office in the middle of the night. It doesn't appear that he knows it's her yet, but he has left a little bait to see if she bites. Interesting, isn't it, how you can work these small things out if you just think about it. Like you got a tiny voice whispering right in your ear trying to tell you who did it. He then goes to see the projectionists and finds out about the changing of the reels, which also confirms Kay's alibi. He then spots the glove that Kay discarded and it looks as if his suspicions are growing. He questions Kay as to why she had the projectionist get those extra films. and She very cleverly says that Mark told her to get them. Kay gives him a tour of the studio and has to deal with a problem with one of their performers during the rehearsal. She goes to deal with it while Columbo finds out about producing live television. And that Kay is very knowledgeable about virtually every aspect of film production. She understands all about this too? I'll tell you about that. If there's one thing worse than a television lady who thinks she knows everything, it's a television lady who knows everything. It's a small detail but an important one as Columbo learns more about his suspect which causes his suspicion to increase. We're then given an almost avant-garde interlude as Columbo plays with the controls and watches as visual feedback loops dance on the screen for him. Meanwhile, Kay deals with a performer, rack with stage fright and going cold turkey from several substances. She manages to whip her into shape via unknown methods. That evening, Kay goes to a run-down abandoned house and after lighting a candle, she notices a neck brace resting on the side right before Columbo makes himself known to her. It's her old home and it leads to them discussing their respective pasts. Columbo has changed tact a little now and is treating her with kid gloves in order to delve into her story. She quickly works out what he's driving at and she tries to head off this process. I hear those little voices going around in your ear, Lieutenant, asking. Could I possibly have miraculously murdered Mark for his job? Columbo says, Oh no, ma'am, I don't think that at all. You were up in the projection booth. And I don't think people kill people for just a job. There must be more to it. We've seen this from him before, throwing the suspect off by claiming they aren't a suspect while also suggesting he only needs to find a good motive to prove his theory. While Columbo continues to investigate, Kay has more difficulties with her problematic performer, Valerie Kirk, who has run off to Kay's house and is blind drunk. Kay is now concerned for her career as Mark's doubts about her suitability seem to be correct, as her judgment seems to be in question. That evening, Columbo goes to see a TV repairman about his own set and we get a cameo, not just from Dog, but also Bruce Kirby, who for some reason is now playing the repairman rather than Sergeant Kramer. He's in time to see a portion of the movie Kay was working on, which has had to replace the Valerie Kirk special. The next day, the viewing figures are in for the movie and they are poor. Mark may have been an insufferable bastard, but it seems he was good at his job. In Mark's office, Kay bumps into Columbo, who maintains her professional demeanour even as Columbo probes her about Mark's sex life, which she claims to have no knowledge of even when pressed. He then reveals that he found a woman's blazer at Mark's beach house and it belongs to Kay. At this point she admits their relationship with Mark. As they're leaving they both get into the elevator and she notices that the murder weapon is now visible. So keeps Columbo talking so he won't notice. It seems to work as he leaves 
and she makes an excuse to go back to her office, where she proceeds to retrieve the gun. As she leaves, she spots the car Mark bought for her in the car park, and the security car approaches her. Miss Freestone, young fellow from the agency left it. I was supposed to give you these. I don't know anything about it. She denies all knowledge of the car and speeds off in her own, stopping to throw the gun in a drain. She definitely appears to be unravelling with the pressure of the job and the intensifying investigation around her. On set of another production, Flanagan arrives. A decision to use the professional as a replacement for Valerie's show. I'm sure you know the ratings are very poor. Nobody knows better than you that the professional costs us a million six hundred thousand, including a second run. Now you wasted the first one. I've also been told that you're uh, you're planning to to move into Mark's uh, office tomorrow. I'll be needing more space. The office comes with the job. But you don't, Kay. He tells her that he's decided to let her go, and she remains resolute to the last, at least to Flanagan. In private, she begins to crack, and as Columbo arrives looking for her, she communicates with him over the intercom, telling him she's far too busy with filming problems. But he insists as he has found out about the car, amongst other things. Kay gets increasingly flustered and attempts to run away, but Columbo has located the control room she's in, he tells her he noticed something when he caught the showing of her film and has a copy of the film to show her. On the film, there are two projectionist cues for real changes. The scene directly afterwards is what the projectionist saw when he came back from getting the reels, meaning she must have changed the reels just before he returned and not when the counter said, giving her time enough to kill Mark. She claims he must have been confused about what he saw, but Colombo is not finished. Our people found it this afternoon. And then we took a second gun, one that looked like this gun, and we put it back on the elevator. After she left the elevator, the gun had been removed, and it could only have been removed by her. She says she is not in any way relieved to have been caught and will still fight the charge, relentless in her convictions until the very end. This is a strange episode in the series, with its unusual opening and so many different threads revealing different parts of Columbo's case. It's also probably the most unmemorable of all the episodes I've watched, as I didn't remember a single thing about it before I re-watched it, and yet there's so much going on. We have a largely sympathetic murderer, despite her faults, who shows fragility just beneath her strong exterior, and yet feels she has to maintain her image even after Columbo has caught her. It's a 90 minute episode, and yet it still lacks exploration of the depth of her friendship with Valerie Kirk, or why Flanagan so completely changes his mind about Kay after one mistake. I think it might have worked better if we had seen no fragility from Kay, if she'd been a great success after taking on Mark's job, so we remain sympathetic to her until perhaps we realise that she engineered the whole relationship with Mark and wasn't upset that she was used, but that he didn't want her to have the job. I feel like that would have been a more satisfying arc for her character. If at the end she had revealed to Columbo that she never loved Mark and killed him for the job, it's a motive that Columbo had earlier rejected. And I think that would have been a lot of fun. The performances are generally excellent. Lainey Kazan is perhaps a little over the top as drunk Valerie, but I think she just about gets away with it. And there's very little filler for a 90 minute episode. Just a few brief interludes of director flair, such as Columbo in the control booth. All in all, this is a solid, if unremarkable, episode, and for that reason, I'd have to give it 3 out of 5. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>